AMD, the underdog in both the CPU and the GPU markets, has been around for a fair while now, with an impressive history and some amazing products along the way. And so in this video, I want to give you pretty much a, a catch up on everything you need to know about AMD. But first, if you wanna see more videos like this one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Like I said, AMD is hardly new. They were founded in 1969, nice, by Jerry Sanders, who worked for, at the time, the industrial giant of Fairchild Semiconductor. Jerry was rather annoyed with the way management was handled in the firm, and so decided to leave and set up his own company, poaching seven of his colleagues on his way out. He was actually following in the same footsteps as Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore, who just the year before had left Fairchild as well to go and set up Intel. It sounds like Fairchild really shot themselves in the foot here, not handling management properly, as the companies that those three men set up are worth around 300 billion today. That's gotta hurt. Now, AMD didn't start out making their own CPUs, so no Zen architecture chips for us for another 50 or so years. Uh, see, this was the time when logic gates and shift registers were pretty much all you had, and so that's what they started out making. They actually started out, very impressively, as a second source manufacturer for their old boss, Fairchild, except they manufactured to US military standards, which helped alleviate some of the apparently significant reliability issues that this bleeding edge tech had. They made their first proprietary product later on in the year, which was a 4-bit shift register, which essentially, while they can be configured in different ways, are generally seen as a single serial input, so you send one bit of data after the other, to four parallel outputs. So, for example, you could have a one, then then send zero, then zero, then one along the serial inputs. And then each of the flip-flops, I know, great name, will store each of those bits and output them across the four lanes. They then branched out into more types of logic from counters to multipliers and plenty more and even manufactured their own RAM or random access memory. The RAM's interesting because it's known as volatile memory as when the power goes out, all of the data that was stored in that memory is lost as it takes some amount of power to maintain the state in the RAM, as opposed to say non-volatile memory that's normally found in stuff like SSDs because you have to actively write to that NAND. AMD went public in 1972 and even became a secondary source supplier for none other than Intel for some of their shift registers, but of course their business with Intel didn't stop there. Intel released the Intel 8080, which was a resounding success, and AMD actually reverse engineered it and sold a clone called the AM9080, fantastic name I know, but Intel started using microcode, a sort of intervention layer between what the programmer writes and what the CPU can actually execute, and so signed a cross-licensing agreement with AMD to allow them to use both their microcode and their CPU designs. That partnership became very useful for Intel when they started to manufacture their x86 CPUs for IBM's new personal computer. IBM stipulated that Intel must have a secondary source manufacturer if they wanted to be the new personal computer's main processor, and so in 1981, Intel and AMD signed a cross-licensing and uh, sort of technology exchange partnership. That would mean Intel and AMD could share their technologies and become secondary source manufacturers for each of each other's technologies. The main outcome of this was that AMD got to manufacture Intel's 8086, 8186, and 8286 CPUs. The partnership was so beneficial to both that they ended up extending the agreement all the way to 1995 with an important addition, the use of arbitration. Now, arbitration is essentially having a third party that's independent of the two companies act as the decider between, well, the two parties depending on a disagreement. That's important, and it's also important to note that it's normally a company and not the legal system that acts as the arbiter in those cases. Now, it's important to know that because in 1986, Intel flat out broke the agreement to stop AMD manufacturing their x86 CPUs. AMD went to arbitration to try and resolve the issue, and the arbiter found in favor 
of AMD. Intel wasn't happy about this and ended up having a fairly lengthy legal battle that ended in 1994 when the California Supreme Court ruled in favor of AMD again. And that wasn't the only time that Intel tried to interfere with AMD's business. In fact, thanks to a Japanese Trade Commission investigation in 2005, we found out that Intel was using some incredibly shady business practices like secret rebates and discounts and even threats to try and lock AMD out of the market. In 2009, Intel agreed to pay AMD a whopping $1.25 billion and renew a five-year technology sharing agreement to settle any outstanding legal battles. And that agreement still stands today in part thanks to AMD's development of the x86-64, AMD 64 instruction set, which is effectively the 64-bit counterpart to Intel's 32-bit x86 instruction set. Now, Intel did try and make their own version, which was found in their Itanium processors, which didn't end up all that well. Well, it was technically the fourth most deployed instruction set architecture in the, uh, in the world. That doesn't say all that much as AMD's uh, AMD 64 x86-64 was much, much, much more popular and Itanium will now be dead as of 2021. Going back to their products, besides the Intel clone CPUs and secondary source manufacturing, AMD made their own first CPU in 1996 with the K5. The K is actually in reference to Kryptonite from Superman, as it was a sort of jab at Intel's market dominance and the idea that their new CPU would be, well, the Kryptonite to Intel's superpowers. Now, a few years later, they came out with the K6, and then a much more familiar name to potentially a lot of you in the Athlon chips. Now, this was the first time that we actually saw a different socket, depending on which brand you went with, either Intel or AMD, where Intel was using the slot one, a sort of slot where your processor was on a PCB, which actually had your heatsink and fan built onto it, and you just dropped the whole thing into your system. Whereas AMD used a remarkably similar slot called slot A. Now, they were actually the same physical connector, so that it would be very easy for motherboard manufacturers to pick and choose between Intel and AMD, and in theory, make adoption of AMD CPUs as seamless as possible. AMD's next set of chips using that x86-64 instruction set came at first with their Opteron server chips, but then very soon after the Athlon 64, which was pretty revolutionary for its time. What was even more revolutionary was the Athlon X2, the first dual core CPU from AMD and pretty early, although Intel's Pentium D came out at pretty much the same time as well. Now, two cores at up to 2.4 gigahertz doesn't sound all that much, but bear in mind that this is what games looked at the, like at the time, so still pretty, pretty impressive. Over the next four years, AMD ramped up the core counts from two to three to four, and in 2009, launched the new Phenom 2 chips. These were pretty impressive as they actually used the same die between the four, three, and two core chips. And actually, at the time, it was kind of interesting to buy one as since they used the same die just with cores disabled, it was possible for you to sometimes buy a dual or triple core die and go into the BIOS and have it unlock some extra cores for a bit of free performance. They found out fairly quickly that was a thing and so started lasering off the semi-broken dies anyway, and so that process mm, kind of stopped pretty quickly. In 2010, they launched the new Phenom 2 X6, a six core monster, at least for the time anyway, that had AMD's turbo core technology Technology, which essentially means that it would run on three cores most of the time, but when you needed a bit of extra performance, it would spin up the other three, so you'd get, well, a bit more performance to go with it. Sadly, even with the extra cores, AMD couldn't really keep up with Intel's offerings at the time, stuff like the i7-980s and the next year, the Sandy Bridge chips that are so infamous now that we kind of all know and love, the 26 and 2700Ks. AMD did try to come back in late 2011 with their Bulldozer series of chips, which didn't really work out all that well. Now those Bulldozer CPUs were actually the first ones that I ever bought myself as my first gaming CPU, and it was also the first CPU that I ever reviewed on the channel. 
badly, and I guess not much changes, but uh, that was the, the kind of bad times for AMD. Their bulldozer, steamroller, and pile driver architectures really weren't all that great. They had heat and power issues, as well as also not being real 8 cores. See, that was a, a topic of a class action lawsuit that was only settled just last year for $12.5 million, which, by the way, you might be able to claim some money back if you ever bought one, but essentially, those 8 core CPUs only actually had four floating point compute units and therefore and some shared cash, which means that they're not real 8 cores generally speaking. AMD generally dwindled in this time with their stock price reaching an all time low of under $2 a share. Now they did manage to hold on to some value thanks to them being put into the current generation consoles, so Xbox One and PlayStation 4, and they're also confirmed for next generation consoles, so PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, which is always good to hear. Happily though, they pulled themselves out of their rot big time because in 2017, they launched their Ryzen series of processors. These debuted with eight real cores and incredible value of money and some fantastic performance to go with it. They weren't quite as fast as Intel in the single threaded applications and a little bit behind in gaming too, but the value for money proposition they offered was pretty much unbeatable and considering Intel had basically been twiddling their thumbs for the last well, eight or so years or better part of a decade with only four cores, up to eight was a very nice change. Now to bring us up to the present, their third generation Ryzen CPUs are incredibly impressive. On their Threadripper per platform, they offer up to 64 cores and on their desktop one, they offer up to 16, which is kind of insane. They also offer great performance and still have fantastic value of money. So things are looking good on the CPU side. Now I say CPUs because we're kind of missing a key part of the picture here, their graphics cards. Now, that story is a lot shorter than their CPUs because in 2006, they just out and out bought ATI, a fairly successful graphics card manufacturer, for around $5.2 billion. Now, like I said, ATI was already a fairly successful GPU maker, including having a majority of the market share, admittedly a fair bit before AMD bought them, but still an impressive feat nonetheless. Now, AMD actually kept the ATI branding up until 2010 when they fully rebranded to AMD, and they included in 2008 their Radeon uh, group name for their graphics cards. Their market share generally declined over the years, which can be attributed to, well, a number of things, including regular issues that plague AMD's cards from excessive power draw and heat output in stuff like their R9 290X and those sorts of cards, and also regular drive issues, including one that happened very, very recently. I'll leave a video up there if you're interested. So that is definitely a downside, but AMD does make some fantastic cards and can often be a very good value for money, depending on the card you're looking at. In fact, the card that's currently strapped to the bottom of this table, the RX 480, was a fantastic option and actually still is a very good value for money, at least at the time of filming. Their RX 400 and 500 series were fantastic, and their RX 5700 XTs and 5600 XTs are also a very good option currently, although they don't tend to have much high-end presence in the you know, RTX 2080 Ti competitor range, although that may change if any of the rumors that we're currently seeing are true. So that is a brief history of AMD. Now there is a lot that I have missed out here, especially a lot of detail, so if there's any per particular points that you find of interest that you think other people should know about, then leave it in the comments below so that, well, everyone can check it out. With that said, I hope that I've caught you up on AMD and kind of a good understanding of where they've come from and where they are now and kind of what interesting challenges they face being both a CPU and GPU manufacturer. Now, like I said at the start, if you want to see more videos like this one, do make sure you hit that subscribe button with the bell notification icon. I want to do some more catch up episodes on people like Intel and Nvidia and a load of other stuff too. And if you have any suggestions, do leave those in the comments down below as well. If you want to support the channel and keep me making these videos, especially these ones that are not necessarily the easiest to uh, get funding for, then do make sure you check out the links in the description down below. There's merch for hoodies or t-shirts like this one. I really like how incredibly soft this uh, premium hoodie is for the particle design. 
do check it out. There's also stuff like Amazon and Overclock GK affiliate links that don't cost you anything to use, but massively help me out when you do use them. There's stuff like Streamlabs OES if you want to start streaming, a couple of VPN links in the description down below too, and a load of other stuff. You can also check out some more videos over there if you want to keep watching. And like I said, feel free to hit that subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this one. If you have any questions, do leave those in the comments down below. And otherwise, I will see you all in the next video.